and again welcome to everybody the uh, on this Christmas morning uh, we celebrate today of course the birth of uh, of Jesus and uh, but also we celebrate his life and we celebrate his message and we take inspiration from those so that within ourselves is born you could say the deeper message that what christ brought to all of us he brought to the world he came into this world as an avatar and it's important for us to understand what that means is an avatar is some is an incarnation of a great soul an unbound free soul comes in not from any personal will but from the you could say as a messenger of the divine it's sent and there's no karma binding that person and jesus was such a one he was an avatar who came with a special purpose and yesterday i hope many of you had a chance to participate in the in the all day meditation or eight hour christmas meditation we have every year and uh, i was also doing that uh, yesterday as well and uh, I was contemplating the life of Christ and what his life was about and the message that he came and uh, it's important for us to think about this and I began to realize that he came if there was a purpose for his kind of coming and the coming of any great soul of that magnitude is not haphazard and I think one of the mistakes that we make is we think we tend to look very closely into the moment and we don't step back and see the larger unfoldment that is taking place, just as Paramahansa Yogananda says in the Autobiography of a Yogi about Babaji. Babaji, and uh, uh, in this case, Babaji and Christ are, are guiding the spiritual unfoldment uh, in, on this planet. Uh, in this age, in this in this time, and you could see that there's a with from that perspective, the coming and going of the great ones are slowly unfolding history, and history moves through different cycles. A bit the those cycles in time that people are able to understand teachings on different levels. And Christ came at such a time. And if I was in thinking about his life, it's really quite simple. Actually, his life was not or at least that's been presented to us, you might say, through history, by what we know of his life. It was, it was relatively uncomplicated to a, uh, to a certain degree. It wasn't philosophical, in other words. It had a simple message, and really Christ's message was, was love God, you know, with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength, and to love thy neighbor as thyself and he said in those two commandments all of the scriptures of or all of the sayings and all the teachings of the prophets are summarized in those two and as it was true in his day i think actually it's the truth is even today those simple truths of love god and love thy neighbors yourself in other words that love that we feel the divine love that comes into us let's share that with others and in a sense he expressed that and his teachings expressed that on the surface they, they they were received it was easy to understand love share be you know and you could see that expressed in his life it was an expression of compassion a sense of of uh, goodwill of kindness of universality of, of acceptance and it resonated very deeply with the common people at that time it wasn't philosophical but we have to understand also that when a when a great master comes their teachings apply on all levels and so there's also behind the scenes of that message that was easily comprehended there was also a deeper meaning there as well and few perhaps understood that his disciples and a few as uh, Jesus would say many times in the Bible for those who have ears to hear let them hear but he spoke in such a way that everybody could understand it at least on that on that uh, basic level the blessed are are the meek blessed are the pure in heart blessed are the are the are the, are the, are the peacemakers this is something that everybody could resonate with and they did and for all of that he ended up being crucified now, isn't that is such an irony such a tragic ending to force it for a teaching that had a certain 
uh, on its on that basic level is extremely pure, extremely universal. How could somebody reject that? But of course it was because, and why? He challenged, you could say, the uh, the status quo of his day. He, he, he challenged the personal interests of those who were in charge of power of the of, in the spiritual of the priesthood, you might say, the very rather harshness and strictness of the teachings that had been come down and somewhat ossified in that long mosaic tradition. And he was basically asking, we must live by the spirit of the scripture not necessarily by the letter of the scripture alone because that letter is interpretive in one way or another according to the you might say the um, the dictates of the individual who's doing that interpretation of society at that time and that message of living by the spirit rather than by just the outward form applies even today but he was rejected rejected but on a deeper level he was he was probably rejected of course because he posed a threat to the status quo, but people could feel that underneath it, the vibration, you could say, the common people felt there was truth in what he offered, and he carried what his message was fresh, and it was universal, and it reached everybody, and you could say, in thinking about that, it was so, I thought, how strange that he should end up being martyred the way he was, but we have to realize that he came in a very different time, a different age, you could say. He came in a time of deep darkness, a dark age, Kali Yuga age. And But yet, interestingly, thinking about that, I think his message, although he came in Kali Yuga for whatever the divine larger, you know, uh, unfoldment of history and has been guided here by the great ones, it must be for the purpose. Although he came with a... In a, in a dark age, his message was actually suited to a Dwapara Yuga. You could say the age that had preceded that as descending Dwapara, or perhaps the ascending age that we find ourselves in now. He was in, because Kali Yuga is an age of, of rigidity, of form, of institutionalism, and especially in his day, of course, the Roman Empire and the laws and the strictures, and they wanted form. They didn't want love thy neighbor. I mean, what is that? But that was the message from inside of the spirit. And that's what was needed at that time to infuse and to bring that message into the world at that time. So steeped in institutional outward form, but it didn't take hold at that time. He certainly paid the price for that, but his message did permeate into the common, uh, the common uh, spirituality of the day. And it began, and what began is just one man and a 12 apostles, and I'm sure there were others who carried that message out, spread throughout the Western world at that time. And it became ultimately, it took hold because it resonated. That message of love is universal. That message of kindness is universal, and it resonates just as much today as it did back then. And it caught hold, but of course, being in a darker age of institutionalism, eventually it too, in an outer form, became institutionalized in, in an outward religious form. And it, I don't think it was, it, it was inevitable. It couldn't, how could it resist that? It had to take some form. And so you had the, the Western churches and, and um, the outward form carried that message through the darker age that the world had to pass through. But he, underneath it, he came with a deeper message that was not, you could say, not able to be broadly uh, disseminated in his time. He fed the surface of it, but there's a deeper aspect to his te teachings that were waiting for time to pass and for society and the general awareness, you could say, of the world itself people in this world to be able to receive that deeper meaning of what his, his teachings were about. And we come then 2000 years later to the mission of the masters of our path. And of course, I always wondered when I first came to these teachings, why did master include Jesus Christ in saying he was part of our tradition, our line? 
It's because the deeper message that Master carried in his mission, in his lifetime, was to reawaken those deeper teachings that Christ brought. Now, the, the basic teachings, yes, that, uh, that are universally still recognized to this day, but underneath it, there was a deeper message that was also being carried in that. And we have now come to the point in the evolution, you might say, of consciousness of the world at large into a higher age when those teachings can now more readily be disseminated. And Master said as part of his mission, his world mission is given to him by his gurus, was to awaken in mankind uh, that original message that Christ brought or Jesus brought and the deeper truths of his teachings. And even so, even, even in his lifetime, Master was repeatedly, he said this, he says, the coming of these teachings of self-realization, of individually each person, person making love to God in their own heart and awakening that consciousness that Christ carried within him, he said, Master with Master, even call this the second coming of Christ. He said the, the reawakening of Christ's individual, his, his teachings. And he would even joke, he, he would say many times, every Sunday, he says, Christ, Jesus Christ was crucified once, mm -hmm. but his teachings have been crucified every Sunday since. <laughs> In other words, that uh, the misunderstanding of the deeper level. Now, that's not always, you know, I mean, he was being uh humorous in that but it does carry some truth and that deeper understanding is was and of course one of the reasons he was crucified is his claim that he was the son of god now that's you know a son of god but how did the in the society two thousand years ago they that was uh that was blasphemous to say such a word but he he would emphasize he says we are all sons and daughters you could say but sons of god we are all that and i i am that you are that but when he was speaking about i he was not speaking from the consciousness of jesus the carpenter perhaps of uh, son of a carpenter from nazareth he was speaking of that cosmic eye that eye of realization one who has realized the deeper truth of who and what we really are and this is what his message was is to awaken all of us to that deeper understanding of, because it's truly then we could see one another as true brothers and sisters of God in that deeper understanding and he and Paramahansa Yogananda said Christ did bring these inner teachings to those who were close to him as his disciples for those who had ears to hear he did bring this deeper teaching, the keys to the kingdom of that inner kingdom of divine awakening that was in each one of us. And so he brought that and awakened people to awake, to be redeemed in the Christ consciousness. Now, that Christ consciousness is a mysterious word, but it's the, it's or phrase, but it's the Kutashta consciousness that could be described in the East, or it's the Krishna consciousness. You could, it's not sectarian. It's a universal state of awareness that we reach, each of us. We reach our sense of true children of God when we expand our consciousness from this little individual self, me and mine, my family, my difference, this little ego self, when we can transcend that consciousness out into the, the, to realizing that we are all brothers and sisters in that consciousness. But we have to go within, go within when he would speak in the Bible. He said, when we, each of us must go into the wilderness, the wilderness being the inner silence and the inner that that uh, uh, inner temple within us and awaken that light within each of us and to show in the process that the teachings of the east and the teachings of west there's a commonality to that now it's very interesting too that we see that when master yogananda said he was sent to the america sent to the west it was not necessarily just sent to the West. He was sent to the world through the West. And he said his mission was to show 
and to focus upon the universality and the commonality of the basic underlying teachings of Jesus Christ in the Bible and of Bhagavan Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita and to show that the same truths in one scripture are also universal and the same as the truths in the other. And to show this, East, then the bring, bringing together in the East and West. And he often when he was probed, asked why, why was, why was uh, that his mission? And he would explain in one level of his explanation, he would say, well, it's in, it's destined. This world is destined in this age. It is the destiny in this world for the East the spirituality of the East and the, and the efficiency, material efficiency to West to come together and to harmonize the best of one with the best of the other and to come together in that, bringing East and West together. And we bring the spirituality of East and West together through the universality of the primary scriptures that are in harmony with the teachings of this age. And he felt that there, those were. And as I said, I have always felt that Christ's teachings were basically a Dwapara, Yunya, Dwapara uh, era uh, scripture. But it's the same thing with the Bhagavad Gita. It was written of, or, or proclaimed, you could say, and then later put into, into written scripture in descending Dwapara Yuga. But in, in, it wasn't fully understood to the depth that's explained by Master and Sri Deshwar and Lady Mahashaya, and as, as it's, it's come to be understood now, in, uh, it couldn't have happened in that previous age. But now that we've entered into a higher age of Dwapara, we can see that the Bhagavad Gita is a scripture for this coming age of Dwapara Yuga. The deeper meaning of it, is, as we understand, has been explained by our gurus, the the symbolism and the meaning of transcendence of the little self into the higher self to give yourself one pointedly as Krishna summarizes in the 18th chapter love if all of this you don't understand all of what I've taught you simply love me love God which was the essential teaching of Jesus Christ love God and as Jesus went on to say love thy neighbor as thyself. So you'll see in the Bible, if you, and I, I've been reading the Bible after many years of not, you know, somewhat forgetting most of what I had known from years past, I decided to reread many parts of it again, because we're doing a class series on it on Monday evenings. And the, there's the important distinction that is uh, Jesus Christ makes in that scripture between the Son of God and the Son of Man. When he speaks of the Son of Man, he's speaking of Jesus, his human form. But when he speaks of the Son of God, he's speaking not of himself as a person or personality. He's speaking of a state of consciousness, a basic state of expanded awareness of one's oneness with all of creation. That's a certain state that we come to as we progress along the spiritual path. And he said, for all of us, and his life was a demonstration. You might say he represents the common soul of all of us going through certain stages where he first, we come onto the path and we are purified. We find our guru. In his case, he was baptized by John the Baptist. And he was, and he said, John, of course, uh, felt incapable or incompetent to be able to baptize such a one as, no, it's you who should be baptizing me. But Jesus tells him, no, no, you baptize me, let it be so, in for righteousness sake, because John had been Jesus's guru in past lives. And so we see he comes to his guru, he's baptized. What does that mean? He's purified. He's purified symbolically, of course, with water, but on a deeper level, and as it explains, he felt the divine spirit of the Holy Ghost, the cosmic creative ohm, the vibration of Om descending upon him. And so it is with us. We must, we, we find our spiritual master. We find our spiritual path. We're purified ourselves. But purification comes with, by going deep within the wilderness within ourselves, the silence within ourselves. And in that purification, we then receive 
the ohm vibration, the, the cosmic spirit comes into us and totally drives away the darkness until finally in that purification, we realize our cosmic oneness with God. And when the soul realizes the vibration in all creation, my heart is in you, my brother, my sister, just as much as it is in me, my, my sense of who and what I am and who my very self, that universality comes. We then enter into that state within that stage of spiritual development, which is known as the Christ consciousness or the Kutashta consciousness, the Krishna consciousness. And this is not sectarian. This is the path that all souls ultimately must travel. We go into that wilderness to awaken. And yesterday in our meditation, that's what we were doing, going into the wilderness to awaken that cosmic vibration within ourselves and feel ourselves in all, all who came to the meditation and all ultimately beyond to our brothers and sisters around the world. And when we send those vibrations of Om, as we often do at the conclusion of our satsangs or when we do in healing prayers, that's what we're doing. And for, to make those prayers effective, we have to feel that universality within ourselves first, and then we project them. And in that way, we could say that as when Christ came, he was crucified, yes, for defying institutionality and defying out the status quo of the outward uh, religion. Also, perhaps he presented a threat to the Roman Empire. All of these reasons are true, but he was particularly, he proclaimed himself as the Redeemer, as the Christ, the prophesied one who would one day come. And this is true again. One day, all of us, will be redeemed. In other words, lifted up, redeemed from darkness into the light. And that Christ consciousness is the Redeemer. It lifts us up and it is our destiny because all of us are Jesus Christ in, in spirit, in the sense, because he, he didn't come, as Swami Kriyananda would so often say, he didn't come as a personality. It's just a historical figure to show how great he was. You know, which is, was a greatness. And of course, we should take inspiration from his example. And he did, he, and we do. But he came to show us our own potential. Ye are gods who, it doesn't, don't, as when he was challenged about claiming to be the son of God and he re responded to people, he would say, don't our own scriptures say that ye all are, ye too are gods, all of us in our essence, of course, our gods. And we've sullied that. We've perhaps fallen into ignorance, but we can be, each of us will be, because it is our destiny to ultimately be redeemed. And so Christ came as an example for that. And as an example in his age, that he was not understood. Most people did not understand it on that deeper level, what he was really about, but he came for a purpose. Let's keep that in mind. There was a purpose to all of the great ones. They come working, I think, in a sense, they work together. One, because in a sense, they're all unified as one. All the great ones, it's not this one's greater than that one. They're all, you could say, uh, fruit of the same tree. And they, each one in the appropriate time in their age, comes to uplift us to that same destiny that applies to all of us. And so I think with the message we want to carry, and I think why we have all of these festival days throughout the year, celebrating the great masters of East and West of different tradition, it's to remind us of the, our own individual potential. And there's no need to make it complicated. What does, what are the great ones really want of us? To love God, to make God a reality in our life, because it's to it, we want to make that love for God more than a sentiment, or more than a, a wonderful thought, but to put those into action, and that's what those two first commandments of Christ are about: love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, soul, and strength. Because it does take strength; it does take uh, it takes effort; it takes will to love God. And then 
to, uh, to love thy neighbor as thyself. And what is that? It's putting that love into motion, into expression, because you can't help it. When you feel joy, when you feel love, when you feel enthusiasm, even for mundane things, what do you want to do? You want to share it with other people. It's much more fun to go into doing something fun when you're doing it with others. Isn't that so? Is It's just the nature of bliss is to expand and to include other people. And that's what we're being asked to do. And that's essentially the essence of all the great religions. It's not the outward performance of rituals, outward performance of ceremonies and of, that are prescribed. Yes, that could be helpful. I don't want to disparage them in any way. They can be helpful, but it's the spirit behind the outward expressions that are important. And I think remembering these essential messages, which are simple, that all the great masters embody. If you look at each of the each of the great ones, they embody something and they come to remind us of that. But in their essence, it's the same. So today, Christmas, let's give that gift of Christmas to one another, which is the gift of God's love, seeing one's neighbor as oneself. And that's in and let's do it in a sense of joyful celebration because if we we act in a sense of joy we find that we summon that joy and when we share that joy that we feel we find that who's the real beneficiary blessed to give more than to receive we find that in the giving we enjoy the gaining and that's the message i think of, of christmas love one another love god and be instruments for that love of God. And every day, let every day, not just December 25th, but let every day be Christmas within us. So God bless all of you. And I, I wish you all the best Christmas blessings today from Sada Devi and myself. Let us now send these blessings of Christmas to all hearts, those parts of the world that are troubled that are particularly in need of blessings. <laughs> And to those individual souls who perhaps are suffering in darkness, let the light shine within them. And to all our brothers and sisters, our Korea bonds around the world, let us share our blessings. That's a wonderful family of masters that the master has created, this wonderful family. Let us feel the blessings of being in that family and strength be brought to each one of us through master and through all of us sharing in that. Let's rub our hands together, send the joy of Christmas, grow the joy of the avatars, the joy of our masters out into the world. Om. 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 And let us conclude with a prayer. Heavenly Father, Father Divine, Mother, Divine Mother, Friend, Beloved God, friend, Great God. Masters of Self-Realization, okay. Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ. Babaji Krishna, Lahiri Mahashai, yes. Swami Shurikteshwar, and Beloved Guru, Great Master Paramahansa Yogananda, all the emissaries of light that have come into the world to share these teachings of self-realization, of universal love, kindness, compassion, the essential message of the Christmas spirit. May it permeate all souls and touch all souls, whether they are in the light or whether they are in darkness. May they feel a little blessing today, a little lighter, a little joy, a little bit more joyful, and may they too be inspired to share that joy with friends and family, with their nations, that we may all live in harmony in this coming year, that it be a time of joyful celebration of God consciousness, of the rising of the Krishna Christ consciousness within all souls, awakening into the light. Om 
Shanti, 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 peace, amen. Om Guru.